Welcome to Praise Hands, home of the Praise Hands, where we are all about creative, cross-cultural Christianity. I'm your host, Robbie Valderrama. If this is your first time listening to the Praise Hands podcast, we are so glad to have you here. Here on the show, we examine the American intersection of church, race, music, and economics. So far this season, we've chatted about worship beyond nationalism with Dr. Rob Huell and her Dr. Esau McCauley share why he believes there's still hope beyond 2020. On today's episode, we talk about an issue affecting millions and millions across America and beyond, the issue of housing insecurity. Currently, the National Eviction Moratorium is set to expire at the end of 2020, but tenants and landlords are already falling behind with no clear relief in sight. As we consider the best courses of action in times like these, we seek counsel from the Lord, and we seek counsel from creative cross-cultural solutionists who have models that work. Today on the Praise Hands podcast, we are honored to bring to you Matt Pritchard from the Boston-based nonprofit Homestart. Through a unique model that saves time and money for both landlords and local government, Homestart has helped 2,500 Boston area households avoid eviction, with 95% of these households maintaining their housing long term. Please join me in welcoming Matt Pritchard. Matt, greetings. Greetings. Hi, Robbie. How are you this fine day? I'm doing really well. Lots to be thankful for. Yeah, absolutely. I've talked to you in the past, but for our listeners, I want to hear again your story. You've got a really unique way that you seem to approach life and some things that you've done that other people may not choose to do. And it's really been a blessing for a lot of people. So I'd I'd love to kind of get the backstory. I'd be happy to lay out some of what that story is. And so, you know, I'll just go back 20 years or so. I you know, was working at a corporate component of General Electric I just graduated from college and started to ask the question, you know, what value am I adding to mankind? You know, I know that the work that we were doing was good, et cetera, but I elected to quit my job in the corporate world. And my intention was to start a a business in an under-resourced neighborhood, kind of move into an under-resourced neighborhood, employ my neighbors, do community development sort of from the inside out. In the process of kind of shaping that vision, I learned that a homeless shelter in Boston had just started a social enterprise um, to employ men and women who were living at the shelter. And so I came out, I was in New York at the time, and I came out to visit to see what they were doing. The little business was six months old, and a couple of weeks after my visit, the director from the board called and asked if I would consider coming to run this little nascent business. Mm -hmm. And I was 22 and I did not know a single thing about anything (laughs) other than, you know, that I loved people. And so I, I accepted the job on the condition that this director teach me everything he knows about building a business. And he was a kind of an executive at Gillette. And so he assured me that he would do that and then accepted the job on the second condition that he allowed me to live in the bunks of the shelter for a year so that I could better understand the challenges associated with homelessness. And so, you know, it was that year of living in the bunks with the guys and, you know, the middle of the night smoke breaks and the fire escape, you know, learning about life that kind of cured a desire for me to look for opportunities to advocate for communities of people experiencing marginalization as much as I could. And so that was about you know, 20 years ago now and got a couple more gray hairs on my head. And, <laughs> and yet I've, I've tried to kind of respond to that voice and that calling since then. That's amazing. So walk us through what Homestart is. This is the nonprofit organization that you help lead and your model is very different than a lot of other models that I've seen. A lot of the traditional models fighting homelessness would be maybe working on food insecurity. What is different about your model and and maybe break it down for us? Sure. So Homestart is a nonprofit here in Boston. You know, we were founded to be New England's first housing first service provider. Mm. And so our role in this is the mid nineties. We were 
started by HUD pilot to explore this idea that if you provide rapid housing services for individuals living on the streets, then that might be a more efficient mechanism than just expanding the emergency shelter system, for instance. So we did that for about 10 years. Initially, it was you know controversial at the time when the sort of status quo was having folks you know, being in the emergency shelter system and doing their best to kind of scrape things together until they could independently move out. And so our job was to uh, effectively accelerate a person's tenure in a shelter system or on the streets. And after about 10 years of that, we gathered the data and learned that, A, the social outcomes for these individuals and families were significantly better than if they had just independently been in the shelter system until they could move themselves out. Um, And then it was significantly less expensive than expanding the shelter system. And so about 2000, we had individuals coming into our office during our walk-in hours saying, you know, I know as a matter of fact, I'm going to be homeless because I have this eviction notice. Is there anything you can do to help me find housing? And by kind of virtue of the parameters within our contract, we contractually could not provide housing search services for these individuals because they were not yet homeless. And so, you know, initially this was a trickle of folks in the early 2000s, and it became a downpour. And after that need ramped up significantly, we started to pull back the layers a little bit. And when we did that, we learned that the average family in Boston who was being evicted was being evicted for a rental debt of, at the time, it was $1,400, which was tiny compared to the spiral it creates. Because when you're evicted, you lose your possessions, you're plunged into debt, your credit's ruined, you typically lose your job because an eviction disrupts everything, and often your family is broken up. You know, children have to live somewhere else or a family ends up living somewhere where they're at risk. It's often a single parent and where their children are in a very vulnerable situation, too. And so we started an eviction prevention program to address that need. That's so good. It's so uh, refreshing to hear about you being entrenched in the community and developing a solution that was founded out of the needs you saw around you and not out of, oh, here's this model that we think should work in this community. We're going to do it until it works. I love the the responsiveness that you've shown to what's already going on in the community. I want to talk about actually some terminology. Identity is so important and how we see ourselves and who we call ourselves. And oftentimes, if people can make us believe we are something, they can then make us do certain things. In your verbiage, you're very intentional to say people experiencing homelessness and Mm -hmm. people experiencing evictions as opposed to that homeless person. Why? Yeah, I think that it's just an effort to honor, you know, our brothers and sisters and neighbors who are unhoused. And, you know, I think that, you know, labels exacerbate stereotypes often. And at least I'll speak for myself when I hear a term like a homeless person as a label, I immediately instinctively have an image of what that is. And that is an elderly person on the side of the street stimming or something of that sort with not wearing clean clothes, et cetera. And yet the reality is that there's a couple of things. Um, One is that image in my head is far removed from the actual picture of the average person experiencing homelessness. So the national data on this is not great, um, but the Massachusetts data is reasonably good. And we know that in Massachusetts, the average age of an individual experiencing homelessness is nine. We know that to be true in Massachusetts. And the other piece is that, you know, when I was living in the shelter, the thing that surprised me was not that I was just like my bunkmates because that was that was obvious within five minutes of being there. You know, all of us were exactly the same and that the only thing any of us wanted was just a little bit of peace. That was it. That characterized every single one of us. But the thing that surprised me was that I found myself over and over and over again wanting to be more like my bunkmates where 
you know, getting knocked down and getting back up was the story of their lives. You know, living in a relatively comfortable first 18 years of my life where I didn't experience homelessness, I wanted more of that. I wanted more of that courage. I wanted more of that perseverance. I wanted more of that creativity and resolve. And so I, you know, have, you know, grown to really honoring the folks who are just understanding how honorable these human beings are, like in spite of what their circumstances are. And this is called the Praise Hands podcast. And let's just keep it real, Robbie. Jesus was homeless. And that's not often how the church thinks about homelessness. Thank you for sharing all that. I think there's a lot that we have to learn. I remember some conversations that I've had with some individuals experiencing homelessness over the last couple of years, and their framework on life is a lot different than that of, of many people that aren't in that situation. And what I've noticed is they tend to think about life a different way and in almost like a reverse way in, in how I might approach it or other people that I might be more familiar with. And it's just so fascinating to see the solutions or the, like you said, the resiliency, the creativity that can come about through that. One of the first shifts that I would love to see in terms of uh, the broader churches, maybe a uh, relationship with this population is really seeing this population as an asset mm-hmm. first and foremost and saying there is something that this population has that maybe uh, those of us in, not in this situation don't have. And I think that's a theme on this show. We talk a lot about multicultural ministry and diversity, and that's an important theme in saying, am I looking at this group, whatever other they are, Mm -hmm. as a group that's primarily going to be a beneficiary of what I have to offer? Mm -hmm. Or am I seeing them as a group that has a unique perspective that I actually value what you have Mm -hmm. and I'm not just doing this out of a, a need based, but out of actual desire based mm-hmm. and an analogy that I would give a lot of times churches are trying to figure out this whole diversity and worship issue. Okay. Do we just put a person of color on stage and then we kind of check that box or maybe is there a little more to it than that? Really? It comes down to, are we valuing what that person is bringing and saying, no, I don't just want you for optics. I don't want you just for the optics of, Oh, we're doing something good for the community and, and working with people experiencing homelessness. But I actually believe that you're made in the image of God, that there's something that is going on inside of you that I need and that you display a part of the beauty of God that I, I want to be around, I want to experience, and together we can grow and have a, a symbiotic relationship. And I think part of this, you know, one of the themes on the show is economics. So much of our lives are filmed through this lens of economics as being our primary filter mm-hmm. in that if somebody has less that means they are less. Mm -hmm. And I think breaking that is so important, not just so people who have less are treated better, but so we can all be whole. I mean, I completely agree, Robbie. And in fact, a lot of the folks that I have the highest regard for have been deliberate about not having much, you know, and just with the generous spirit. But, you know, to me, you know, so much of, if, if again, as the, you know, the Praise Hands podcast, and, you know, when I say church, like, I just want you to hear that I'm talking about myself, like, I'm not trying to throw a stone. Right, right. I'm just sort of identifying with patterns in my life where, you know, I, I think that the starting place is a couple of things. One is, to say, like, regardless of what our circumstantial experience has been, the place you start is to understand that there's material poverty, there's spiritual poverty, there's emotional poverty. And everyone, in my experience, has a a very intimate experience with some level of poverty or another. And so you really have to start as that of like identifying as a peer you know, seeing someone eye to eye, regardless of which of those kinds of poverty they're experiencing. So that's one place. And, you know, another place where I go to is just with my bunkmates. I ran this this exercise. It was very helpful for me to sort of switch the gears in my head. 
And that was one of those counterfactual historical exercises where you say, if you had removed one healthy variable in my life and inserted it with an unhealthy variable, how would the course of my life look different? So to me, it was very personal because one of my bunkmates was 20 years old. He was selling himself in Boston Common to finance his addiction. He had experienced a lot of abuse in the background in his past. And he was introduced to substance because he was told that he wouldn't despair if he had tried the substance. And, you know, when I thought about the person who was perpetrating him, who was abusing him, it was a family member. And, you know, as, as a kid, I had an uncle who lived with our family for a number of years, who happened to be the most encouraging, uplifting person you can imagine. But if you had taken him out and put an abusive family member in there, you know, would I have been trying to anesthetize myself from some level of pain experience from there? And so like going through that exercise of thinking it's, it was typically, you know, one or two different things in another person's life who led to a certain path that could have very easily been me and my story too. Yeah. So speaking of people's stories, is there maybe a story or two that you could share that is particularly inspiring to you of some lives that have been changed through Homestart? Boy, there are a lot of stories that I could share, but you know, one is is one that I think that you and I might have talked about before, Robbie, and that was one of my old bunk mates mm-hmm. who was 25 years old, single dad who, because of an unexpected event that was of absolute no fault of his own, was evicted with his five-year-old little boy. And so he and his son lived in his car for about two months. And my friend was developing this narrative so his son wouldn't understand that they were homeless. And so the narrative was, you know, this evening we're going to stay in this alley because there's pirates in the alley from last night, et cetera. And, you know, every morning he would drive and drop his son off at school. And after about two months, one afternoon, he went to pick his son up from school. And he was met on the front steps of the school by his son's teacher, the principal, a police officer, and a worker from the Department of Children and Families. And he lost custody of his son right on the front steps of that school. And so his son, they had no family support. His son went to a foster care situation and Jason came to live in the bunks with me because he had nowhere else to go. And this man, his son was his whole life. His heart revolved around this precious little five-year-old boy. And so he worked his tail off to get first, last and security and find housing so that he could regain custody of a son. That happened before Homestart had developed its eviction prevention program. And so our eviction prevention program works basically like this. We meet a family in court who's being evicted. We make a small payment to the property owner to stop the eviction and buy some time. We work with that family for 12 months while they repay the balance of that debt and while we create a blueprint with them to mitigate against the risk of eviction happening again. And three years after our engagement, only 5% of our households have been evicted. The program works. And we've done this thousands of times now in Boston. And we also learned something else very interesting, and that was property owners are paying, the Boston Housing Authority, for instance, finance team showed us that they were paying over $10,000 to evict a family. Um, And that expense comes through turnover of the apartment, vacancy of the unit, legal fees, constable fees, storage fees. But it was only costing Homestart $2,000 to prevent that eviction from happening. And so we created the nation's first per intervention of reimbursement rate contract. And now property owners are paying Homestart to prevent the evictions they're trying to execute because they know that there's a significant financial ROI for them and that the program works and sticks. 
That's incredible. And I think there were some numbers, if I remember correctly, even on the city side or the government side, that it's saving them money as well. Is that correct? Yeah. So the housing authority in Boston showed us that last year they saved over $1 million last year alone because of their participation in our eviction prevention program. We've prevented about 2,500 households from being evicted, and 95% of those will maintain their housing in the long term. Wow, that's incredible. I mean, to think of every one of those as a story, every one of those as a Jason that doesn't have to be in that situation is so inspiring. I want to talk through maybe a, a interesting angle on this. There's this talk of ID2020, this move to give everyone a digital ID. Mm. And one of the primary proposed methods for that is through an implant that would potentially have a vaccine along with it that would be able to give everybody a, a digital ID. And how this is being pitched is essentially not leaving anyone out from the global economy. In some conversations that I've had with homeless people, some of them actually don't want to be a part of that. Can you maybe speak to your experience? Is that an element at play at all? Yeah, I mean, I, I can think of a lot of people who are not experiencing homelessness who would not want to participate in that level of tracking as well for privacy issues. But the, the broader question, if, if the impulse and desire to do something like this is there's no doubt we need to improve tracking of COVID-19, for instance, or disease of that sort, from a kind of a universal service provider perspective, you know, there's a lot of work happening municipally and also across Massachusetts and other places to coordinate systems of service. They could remove some obstacles to them receiving excellent service. And so I think that there's a ton of opportunity for that. And I think that if a person elects to have a universal identification vehicle to help make that more efficient, then that's fine. But I do think that there are a whole host of agencies and players who are trying to build a more efficient system without that kind of identification. Yeah, that makes sense. I've got a Boston specific question for you. Maybe about 50 years ago or so, the Federal Highway Act created like 41,000 miles worth of interstate freeways. And one of those freeways was I-93 that was built somewhere in that. And a lot of writing has come out in terms of the mixed reviews on freeways and how they can sometimes pull apart the fabric of cities. In Boston, I-93 was pulled down. Can you share maybe some perspective on how that has affected the Boston community? Well, it's, it's certainly the traffic is substantially better now and it's a lot more beautiful downtown than it was. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's for sure. I think from a, a community, um, I have a couple of mentors who are elderly folks of color who um, were a part of the movement to try to prevent some of you know, their neighborhoods for being negatively impacted by 93 and they were largely unsuccessful in that effort you know, 50, 40 years ago or so. But from a livability perspective and a walkability perspective, I mean, Boston's a very appealing place right now. Right. I've got one more question for you. You have been a part of Praxis Labs and it's so important to be in community. And I'm curious to hear, how has that experience been for you? And what advice would you give to entrepreneurs or people uh, doing social good when it comes to surrounding yourself with people you can learn from? Yeah, well, I mean, the number one tip for an entrepreneur is just don't try to go it alone. And, you know, I became involved in Praxis because the subtext, you know, the pitch was, this is an accelerator, an opportunity for you to surround yourselves with fabulous mentors and potentially resources to help accelerate the work that you were doing. But it wasn't until I arrived did I realize that the principal interest from Praxis is that the innovator, the entrepreneur, is healthy because beauty that might come from an organization is most often sustainable if the entrepreneur is living in a way where the entrepreneur is experiencing herself or himself love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. And frankly, the Praxis team spoke a lot of truth to me in love where you know, I wasn't living in a sustainable way. You know, which is also often very common for entrepreneurs and innovators is to burn the candle at both ends. 
and not be built to last. And their whole premise is if you're trying to build your organization to last, your life needs to be built to last as well. That's really good. Well, well, Matt, do you have any closing piece of advice for entrepreneurs, for people that want to make creative cross-cultural solutions in this world and, and do so in a healthy way? Yeah. You know, the first thing I would say, Robbie, is that point that you made early in this conversation, which is just listen, listen, and understand the experience and perspective of a person who's struggling. I mean, that's like you pointed out, like one of the things I love about Homestart, and I can say this because I wasn't the founder of Homestart. All of its programs were not because I, you know, Matt Pritchard had something to do with them, but because my predecessors were very good at understanding the felt needs of the individuals who are now receiving services. Those individuals informed how the program would work, how it would be optimized, um, what our strategy for approach is. And so be, be very careful against confirmation bias. You know, surround yourselves with truth tellers. And most of all, listen to how your heart is tugging you. Listen to the voices of people around you. Yeah, that's really good. Well, lastly, how can people learn more about Homestart and check out what you guys are doing? Sure. So our website is www.homestart.org. Very easy to find us. My contact information is there on the page, Matt Pritchard. Um, If you have any questions, you're more than welcome to send me an email. It's my last name, Pritchard at homestart.org with a T in the middle of that Pritchard. And I'd love to help in any way I can as we're doing this together. We're in this thing together. Amazing, Matt. Thank you so much for your time. Looking forward to seeing what else comes of the amazing work you guys are doing up there in Boston. Thanks so much, Robbie. It was a joy to spend some time with you. Absolutely. Likewise. So good. When I think about Matt's story, I can't help but think of the exponential return on investment Matt received from his sacrifice. He spent one year in shelters, and that one year has resulted in thousands of hours less in shelters for families across the Boston area. Wherever you are, I challenge you with this. What can you sacrifice that will result in an exponential return, even if others are the ones who benefit? Well, guys, as always, thank you for learning and growing with us. If you'd like to join the discussion about this episode and others, join our private curated Facebook group at praisehands.com slash get involved. At that same link, that's praisehands.com slash get involved. You can become a monthly financial supporter of this show, as well as join our growing volunteer team. Thank you for tuning in, friends. May the Lord be with you and your loved ones in a special way during these crazy times. We'll see you back right here in two weeks' time.